Morning, everybody. How are we doing? It's great to see you. Uh, wow, what a, what a start to the new year, huh? You know, I, I love that song that we just sang about the Lion of Judah. You know, the Lion of Judah is Jesus Christ, and the Lion roars as we share His Word and as the Holy Spirit makes that Word real to people's hearts. Those mountains are laid low as our pride in our ability to save ourselves, as that comes down, that those valleys are raised up, as we let go of the despair, our inability to save ourselves, and God shows us that forgiveness, those valleys are raised up, and the way of the Lord in people's lives is prepared. You know, as we, as we speak the gospel, the word, the word gospel means good news. And it's, it's God's will that His gospel, His good news, goes everywhere to everybody. And uh, we've been hearing about this over the last couple of weeks. You know, the, the preacher Charles Spurgeon, he once said this. He said, the gospel is like a caged lion. It doesn't need to be defended. It just needs to be let out of its cage. I love that quote. You see, the seed of the gospel, it has life in it. And as we speak the gospel, the Holy Spirit will confirm His Word to people's hearts, even hearts that are dead to the things of God. Jesus said this. He said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, that's how the gospel works. See, as we speak out the good news that Jesus saves even if someone's heart is dead to the things of God, the Holy Spirit makes that real in their hearts. And I want to start out today by celebrating a win for this good news, a win for the gospel. Uh, the Apostle Paul said this one time. He said, and how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? See, see that's what changed this past year for, for a people group called the Miwadi. Now, last year, we were going through something called the One Campaign, and this was a, 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 something, a global effort where all, lots of different churches came together. They went through the same sermon series, and these churches were sponsoring languages to be translated into these, um, these people group languages that had not received the gospel yet. And we actually, as a church, we helped support the Miwari language translation. And thank God that that translation is now finished, and we're going to hear that today. But before we do, I want you just to imagine for a second, what if you and everybody you have ever known had zero contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with the Word of God? Nobody you know has ever heard this. Okay, so we're going to play a, a, a segment of the Mawadi translation, and I want us to listen to this. Taake tha, o puri tarayon jaan sako ke, ji bhi baata, tha nahi kai ki hai, vihaji anatal hai. Yehudiya ke raja Herodes ki time mein. मंदिर में सेवा चाकरी करवा वाला समाज को अव्या पीढ़ी में हूँ एक जकरिया नाम को एक सेवा करवा वालो याजक हो वॉट इफ द रेस्ट ऑफ एवरीबॉडी एल्स हैज द स्क्रिप्चर बट इट साउंड लाइक दैट टू यू वॉट इफ दिस इज द ओनली टाइप ऑफ एक्सपोजर यू और एनी वाइल्स यू नो हेड एवर हैड टू द स्क्रिप्चर टू द गॉस्पल ऑफ जीजस क्राइस दैट्स द डिफरेंस दट दिस मेक्स What we just heard was John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that message is now accessible to over 4 million Mawari people in the country of India. So let's, let, yeah, let's praise the Lord for that. And, uh, you know, I want to thank everybody who contributed to that effort. Um, that made a real difference. The Scripture is now accessible in a form that even people who can't read, they can listen to the Word of God. You, you know, that's each of us doing our part. The, the Apostle Paul spoke about that, and he said this, 
From him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, and it grows and it builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So there's different parts for different people in the body of Christ, but as we all do our part, then the body of Christ builds itself up in love. And you know, I think now our part in this Miwari translation is praying that the Lord would grant boldness and grant openness and would, would really open the ears and the, the eyes of the people who have never heard His Word. Can we do that right now? Father, we pray because Your mission is supernatural from first to last. Lord, only You can open, open the eyes Open the, the ears, Lord. Open, open our minds to understand your word. And I pray, Father, that as your word is now available in this language, I pray for boldness for the people who will take your word there. And I pray, Lord, that you would open the hearts of the people who hear it, Lord, as only you can. Father, we commit this to you, and we thank you so much for giving us a part to play in what you're doing, Lord, in building your kingdom in this world. We just pray and commit these things to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in a series right now called The Mandate. And The Mandate is something that we have as the Church of Jesus Christ to bring the gospel everywhere to everybody. That, that, that's the fundamentals of the Great Commission. Our job as the church is to do this, that the whole church is to bring the whole gospel to the whole world. That's why we're here, fundamentally. So, so we're, we were looking at this in two parts, right? The, the first part that we were looking at last week, we were talking about God's heart for the nations, His heart that all the nations would be able to come and would enjoy His glory, would, would know His presence, and, and spend an eternity with Him. That's His will. That's, that's our white-hot why of mission. That this good news, this good news that Jesus saves would go globally and it would be accessible to every single people group on earth. And we made the, the, the point last week that this series is a little bit different than what we're used to, right? That, that what, usually we're talking about ways that we can grow in our faith, the, the ways that we can... Um, God meets us in our pain, that, that God meets us in, in the struggles that we, we go through. And this series is calling us actually beyond that, into what God is doing in the world around us. And last week, we, we traced God's heart all the way through Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, talking in the narrative of Scripture about God's heart that the nations would know Him, that the nations would come and enjoy His glory. And we talked about these two great expressions of God's heart, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. Now, the Great Commandment, that's found in, in Luke 10. It's also found early in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And the Great Commandment is essentially God's command for us to love Him with everything that we've got, and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. That's, that's the Great Commandment of Scripture. The second great expression of God's heart is found in the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is what Jesus told His disciples right before He ascended into heaven. You find that at the end of the Gospels, in Matthew chapter 28 and other Gospels. And the Great Commission is essentially God's command that His people bring this message of good news everywhere to everybody, every people group on earth. The original language says pantata ethne. In other words, all ethnic groups, all people groups on the face of the earth need to hear this. And you know, we, we ended with a question. And our, our question was this, why are we so worried about taking the gospel where it's not yet been heard? I mean, we're 2,000 years after Jesus, right? The gospel has reached a lot of places. I mean, people in America need Jesus. So, so why are we so worried about crossing these barriers of geography, language, culture? What, why do that when there's people right here who need Jesus? Why would we do that? And you know, we, we came up with a really simple answer to that. 
And the answer was simply that that's what Jesus told us to do. And that's really where the discussion ends. That's what we're here for. We're here to worship Him, to enjoy Him, to grow in Him, and to bring that message, Jesus saves, to literally every people group on the planet. Now this week, we're going to switch our focus from talking mainly about God's heart for the nations as expressed in Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, and we're going to be talking this week about what is our role in that? What is our commission? What, what's our part that we can play in what God is doing to bring His good news to the whole world? So to start us off, we're going to actually do something a little bit unusual here. And we're going to spend about four minutes of service time actually watching a video. And this video is going to start to give us just a little bit of a reality check on what is the state of mission right now. How is the church of Jesus Christ engaging? What remains to be done? And I think this video is going to frame for us, like, what are we? To, what moment are we in? What are we to do as the church of Jesus Christ right now in our generation to get this gospel where it's not? Now, when you walked in, you received a penny, right? So I want you to take out that penny and hold it up. That, that penny is going to be real important in, in us just viscerally understanding what this video is saying and what we're focusing on here about our great commission of the church of Jesus Christ. I want you to hold that penny as we listen to this video now. So let's play the video. Jesus told us 2,000 years ago that our mission is to go and make disciples of all nations. He also promised us that only after we accomplish that task will we receive the blessing of His return. So, how are we doing accomplishing our mission? To answer that, let's classify the 7 billion people on the earth today into three groups. Let's start with the Christians. About 33% of the world's population would identify itself as Christian. We call this segment of the population World C, C for Christian. It's important to remember that not all of the people that fall into World C are true believers in Christ. They merely identify themselves as Christian because of nominal belief in Jesus or because they live in a country where everyone is considered Christian, so they would do the same. Next, there's the 38% of the world that has access to the gospel but has chosen not to follow Jesus. They have Bibles in their language, churches nearby, friends or co-workers who are potentially Christians, or access to other Christian resources in their language. These people have access to the good news, but just haven't acted on it yet. This segment of the population is called World B. That leaves us with 29% of the world, just over one out of every four people on this planet who not only have never heard of Jesus, they have no chance of hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. They have no access to the gospel, no Bibles, no churches, no believers nearby, no chance to learn about Jesus. We call that 29% World A. Now on to missionaries. Only one out of every 1,800 Christians in World C decides to serve as a cross-cultural missionary. So we can pull 400,000 missionaries out of that World C population. That's our total cross-cultural missionary force worldwide. Did you know that 72% of all our missionaries are going to World C? That's right, the vast majority of the missionaries being sent out are going to the people of the world that have Bibles and established churches. 25% of the missionaries are sent to World B, where there is already some access to the church and to the Bible. That leaves only 3% of the total missionary force to handle all of World A, the section of the population without any chance of hearing about Jesus. 29% of the world has no way to hear the gospel, but we're sending only a tiny portion of our Christian workers to them. What about finances? Annually, all those Christians in World C earn a total of $42 trillion. And together, they give about $700 billion to Christian causes each year. That includes everything, Christian nonprofits, churches, youth programs, missions, etc. Can you do the math? Less than 2% of Christian income is being given to Christ's causes. Out of that 700 billion given to all Christian causes, 
Only 45 billion is given to missions specifically. That's a little over 6%. In fact, there is more money reported embezzled from the church each year than is given to missions. Remember those 400,000 missionaries? We have $45 billion to support them and their cross-cultural work. But how exactly is it allocated? Well, $39 billion goes to World Sea every year. Yep, 87% of that mission's money is being spent in areas of the world that have Bibles and churches available. $5.4 billion, or 12%, goes to World B each year, those that have access to the gospel message but have rejected it. That leaves only $450 million, or 1% of all missions money, going to World A, the least reached people of the world. To put that into perspective, annually Americans spend more money on Halloween costumes for their pets than get sent to World A. To summarize, only 3% of our missionary force, armed with only 1% of missions giving, is going out to reach the 2 billion people who don't have access to the gospel. Two billion people are still waiting for the good news of Jesus Christ. So here's a question for you. What are you going to do to change that? You know, I love their final question there. What are you going to do to change that? See, here's the point. The point is that we are able to do better than that. As the church of Jesus Christ globally, we have the capacity to engage further in God's heart to get the gospel where it hasn't been heard yet. See, our great commission is this. Our great commission is going to all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And we all have a part in making that happen, every single one of us. But what we, what we just saw has come to be known as the great imbalance. Okay, we talked about the great commandment to, to love God and everybody. Talked about the great commission to take the gospel where it's not. What we just saw has come to be known as the great imbalance. So you, you got that penny still? Hold out that penny. That penny represents the amount of every missions dollar. In other words, not, not the total giving to mission. The money that is allocated to missions that you're holding, how much of that dollar makes it to getting the gospel where it hasn't been heard yet? That's, that's sobering. 3% of our people with 1% of our resources. You, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a numbers person, this is going to connect with you. All right? Now, I want it to connect with everybody, so I want to do this. Okay? If 1% makes it to the unreached, of the 6% that's allotted to ministry, of the 2% that's available, <laughs> there is a very small amount that's going to get the gospel where it's not. And we can change that. See, here's the reality. The reality is that today, the church of Jesus Christ, in terms of its total global financial capacity, invests 0.0012% of our total financial capacity in the unreached. Feel that. And when we leave the burden of reaching the unreached to 0.0017% of the believers worldwide. 3% of the missionary force, but of, of the number of believers worldwide, 0.0017% of us are engaged in that. You feel it? it see, that's what we mean by the great imbalance. Here, now, again, please hear my heart on this. Okay? We need to build the church where it exists. We need to strengthen the churches that are out there. We need to help the orphan. We need to help the poor. We must do that everywhere that the church exists. We must do that. And 97% of our people and nine, about 99% of our resources are doing exactly that. Meanwhile, 3% of our people and 1% of our resources are invested in getting the gospel to people who have never 
heard the word of God. Nobody in their ethnic group has ever known Jesus Christ, read the scripture. So, so no one's saying that going to places that are reached is wrong. Nobody is saying that. We're just asking a question. Did we get the balance right? There was a man named William Booth. He was the founder of Salvation Army. And as he was bringing people into the work that God was doing and building the Salvation Army and its work all around the world, he said this. He said, I would wish that our people could spend one night in hell so that we could understand the urgency of our task. Now, that's extreme, but let me ask the question. Do we? Do we understand the urgency of our task? See, see, the reality is that on the frontiers where nobody knows about Jesus, that, that's a scary place. It really is. I mean, it, poverty, poverty is global. Poverty is a scary thing. It really is. I've lived and worked among it uh, for a lot of years of my life. Poverty is a scary thing. And we can work with the poor, both among the reached and the unreached. We can do that. Uh, now, personally, j just speaking personally, what would Mark Avery rather do? Mark would probably rather go where the gospel has already taken hold, right? Where the church already exists. See, I'd, I'd rather go to the reached because really and truly, even though the fruit is still very difficult... There's so much work that's already been done in those places. You know, we go to the reach because we project on the people who are giving to mission, the donors who are giving to mission, we project on them this idea that donors really only pay for results, so we should switch our bottom line from faithfulness to fruitfulness. And so we only go where there's quick fruit. So our bottom line changes. What we celebrate changes. You know, we, I think we go to the, un, to the reached sometimes, the places where the church already is, because bottom line is that the resistance is just lower. They're, they're not trying to kill us, right? Sometimes I think we go to the reached because, it, you know, we can just connect with work that's already happening in those places, and when we do that and they take on our name, then bingo, overnight, we're XYZ International now. I think sometimes we go to the reach because we feel a stronger sense of obligation to the family and friends that we already have. You know, we're like ZCC itself it is a very multicultural congregation. I'm not from America originally. And there's many, many people here who are not from America originally. Don't you have a stronger sense of community and, and obligation to the countries you come from than countries that we've never been to, we've, some we've never even heard of, people we've never met? Don't you feel a stronger sense of obligation there? And sometimes I wonder if we go to the places that are already reached because we have in mind that maybe we can succeed, maybe we can have something to show for the effort, whether or not God shows up in power, whether God moves supernaturally or not. We can still take our pictures. We can still have something to show for it. You know, I think, I think bottom line is we, we go to places that are reached already, because at our very core, we're afraid. We, we fear what going to the frontiers of mission will actually mean years into that process. I fear that. Don't you fear that? I mean, the, the Apostle Paul actually wrote about that once. And uh, he talked about when he went to the province of Asia and the struggles that he met there. He said, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we were despaired of life itself. 
Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And you know, that, that type of reality, that scares me. I, I fear being that desperately dependent on the supernatural work of God. But you know, I, I also understand that our fear cannot control our mission. That can't be what's driving the boat. So, so I've got a new question for us. What would we be doing if we were not afraid? What would we be doing if we were not afraid? Let's go back to that picture we just showed. See, the, the frontier of mission is completely different. These people have absolutely no idea what you're talking about when they, when, if you told them Jesus Christ died for your sins so that you could live forever with him in heaven, they wouldn't understand a single key word in that sentence, in their language, just because they have no background, absolutely no understanding of the narrative of the scripture and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Frontier mission is utterly different than what we're used to. Let's go back to that quote. See, to engage in the frontier, some different things are needed to engage in the frontier of mission. See, if we're going to actually engage on the frontiers of mission work in our generation, then we need a kind of courage that really only comes from a living faith in Jesus Christ. We need the, the kind of perseverance that really comes only from God's calling on our hearts as believers. It's the only play, it's the only way we're going to have the strength to actually make it. it we, we need that passion that really comes only from God's living love in our hearts. And you know, we need the power that only comes from the Holy Spirit of God as God does His work supernaturally. And you know what the wonderful thing is? The wonderful thing is that that is exactly what God is doing. He is calling out His people. He is building His church. He is confirming His word with signs and wonders. He is getting the, the scripture translated into every language on earth. That, that is happening right now. There's people working on that. God is confirming his word with signs and wonders through the power of his Holy Spirit. As people share the gospel, people are being healed as, as they get prayed for. In Jesus' name, God is doing that right now in our generation, in our world. And I want to share with you some of the, the things that God is doing in mission today. With, with the five loaves and the two fish that we're bringing him, God is doing incredible things. Things that we can celebrate. So, so if you listen to that video that we just saw, yes, I do want to change. That I do want to be involved in getting the gospel of Jesus Christ where it has not yet been heard. I've got great news for you. But we're going to look at three of the, just the mighty things that God is doing in our generation in getting the gospel out there. The first is what we call movements, whole movements of church planting and disciple making. These movements are where the gospel is traveling through social networks within the, uh, the people groups that missionaries are going to. And it's not just a foreign missionary going overseas to plant a church. In, in the old days, what would happen is a foreign missionary would go from the west to the east or the north to the south. And those who would le learn the language and the culture and stay there long enough, they, they would plant a church. And that, that church would, would exist and then, then seek to grow. But what we're seeing now is that God is raising up near culture peoples. Now what that means is that people group A over here, they have never received the, the scripture, never, never heard the gospel, the word of God. People group B over here li lives in close proximity to them and they have 
heard the word of God, and the church is starting to grow here. What we're seeing is that as, as God is planting his church here, as foreign missionaries come and work with that church, they can come to this people group over here that has not heard yet. And what we're seeing is that the gospel is traveling as, as people who are much more like them share the gospel. The gospel is traveling through these networks of business, of, of, of neighborhoods, of family. And as, as friends are inviting friends to just these discovery Bible studies, just come and read the Bible with us and talk about it. It's that simple. As that's happening, these cell churches are starting to come up, and, and hundreds if not thousands of people are coming to faith in Christ through this type of movement of God's Spirit in the world around us. You know, these people, they're, they're meeting in each other's homes. They're, they're literally, they're writing their own worship music because no worship music exists in their language and style. So they're literally making it up. And they're, they're creating their own worship songs as the church begins to grow among that people group. And, you know, the, the Lord is empowering them that as they pray for people in their sphere of influence for healing, the Lord is moving and they're seeing people healed in Jesus' name. So it's exactly what Scripture talks about. That, that Jesus said that the Word of God would be confirmed with signs and wonders, and that is exactly what's happening. The second thing that is a huge encouragement for us as we look to the world of mission is the dynamic of mega cities. There are cities in the world today that are larger. The population of just that city is larger than the population of some countries were even a generation or two ago. And what's happening is in these mega cities, people are moving to these mega cities. And as they come there, they're being exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because, see, back in their villages, back in their towns, they were highly isolated and under, under very strict social taboos, right? But when they come to the city, a lot of that is removed, and all of a sudden they're, they're wor working with and they're walking around people who know Jesus Christ. And what happens is as the gospel grows within that type of a context and starts to touch these unreached people groups, what happens is as they come to faith in Jesus Christ, they can reach back to their villages and, and they stay connected through, everybody has a cell phone, let's get that, everybody has a cell phone, everybody has WhatsApp on their cell phone, and so, so they can start to share the message of the gospel with their family back home. And what happens is the people in the city become very often the providers for the people in the towns. So the gospel stays present. They don't just get kicked out. And that's a wonderful dynamic that God is doing in our time. You know, the third is something that we call diaspora. And diaspora is just basically a fancy way of saying everybody is moving everywhere for lots of different reasons, right? It might be cheap travel, but we've never been able to literally cross the globe in 18 hours. That's never been true until the past hundred something years, right? So, so part of it is that. Part of it is the fact that the population of the world is exploding. Part of it is business travel. Part of it is education. Part of it is fleeing social unrest or even warfare. But the reality is that the people are coming from these places and people groups and countries which are highly militantly anti-Christian. And these people are being cast up on the shores of countries where the gospel has already taken root. And this is a tremendous opportunity for the gospel in our generation. Did, did you know that one of the largest populations of Indians outside of India all clustered together in one space, what one of the largest populations of Indians outside of India is 20 minutes down the road from this building in the Edison Islin area of New Jersey. Did you know that? It's incredible. Did you know that Jackson Heights, New York, which is about 45 minutes away from here, Jackson Heights, New York, is home to well over 150 different Southeast Asian people groups. 
There's people from those groups there, so, some of them from, from countries that are militantly anti-Christian, and they're literally 45 minutes away. Did you know that we have a refugee resettlement office in Highland Park, 15 minutes from this building? And there's all kinds of role, volunteer roles that we can play. How would you like to next week pick up a Somali family from the airport? None of us are ever going to make it, probably, to Somalia. Wouldn't that be incredible? Did, did you know that, that Rutgers University, the Princeton University, both have active outreaches to international students in their university? And, and those, those people are coming from countries, some of them have no exposure at all to the gospel. And we can work with these people right here, right now, from where we're sitting. We can work with these people. They're minutes from our front door. See, I, would, I said I would share with you how ZCC wants to get involved in this area of mission, of frontier mission. You know, we're, we're moving into this one campaign that we talked about before, about where all the churches from uh, various cities around the world are, are going to be going through the same sermon series. And we're going to be cooperating as churches to fund these, uh, these languages. We're going to be praying for God to use that. We're going to be praying that the gospel would, be, would go forth. And we're going to move beyond that. We're also going to be learning about how do you share your faith with a Hindu or a Muslim or a Buddhist? How do you do that? How do you share Jesus? Where do you start? What questions are they likely to have? We want to equip you to have those conversations with your coworkers, your neighbors, people around you. We want to work with these groups who are, who are in direct contact with this diaspora who's coming right here to New Jersey. The, these university outreaches, the Refugee Resettlement Office. We want to take lo local short-term trips to areas of New Jersey that are, are a majority of the people in those areas are not, not like, um, didn't, didn't grow up here in New Jersey, that they grew up overseas. And we want to do local short-term mission trips so that we can expose our people to, to communities right here in our neighborhoods that are so different than what we know. And we're going to be praying as a church about one Hindu Buddhist. Those are um, sister religions. That they're both based on the fun, same fundamentals of worldview. So one Hindu worldview engagement and one Islamic Muslim engagement in a frontier people group. And we're going to be praying and seeking the Lord. Lord, which, where, where would you have us focus and work? And as the Lord shows us that, we're, we're going to seek the Lord for a coalition of partners to come around that frontier people group and just seek the Lord. Lord, what is it going to take to reach this people group with the gospel? And you know, we're not going to stop there. We're, we're going to be looking for opportunities to engage the skills, the gifting, the background, the people of Zarephath Christian Church. How could we engage in places like this? How, how, if, how could a person from New Jersey show up at a place like this with something to offer? There are things we can bring. And, and we're going to be praying and seeking the Lord about that. This is actually a shot from one of our mission trips to Nepal, and God used a short-term team from this church in the, in, literally in the top of a Himalayan mountain. Praise God for that. You know, there is a, there's a man named William Carey. William Carey was a cobbler. He, he, literally, he made shoes, and then he felt God's call, but God's burden to go to share the, the gospel of Jesus Christ in areas that hadn't heard it yet. God called him to do that. He went, he was involved in multiple translations of scripture. He became known as the father of modern missions, William Carey. And William Carey said this. He said, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. And I hope 
I hope that God uses the time we've just spent together over the past 25 minutes, 30 minutes, looking at mission. I hope God uses this time to raise our aspirations for how he could use us to get the gospel where it's not. You know, let's, let's pray that the Lord would revive us with his joy. It, it, the, Jesus talked about that. He said this. He said, even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Okay, there's a joy that we can share as we all participate. We do our part in this great commission. The Apostle Paul wrote about that, and he said, one plants, another waters, but only God makes things grow. You see, growth, growth is where the glory lies. And that glory for growth, that belongs to him. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to him. So, so let's get engaged. Let, let's start praying that God would revive his church, call out his church into the mission that he has. See, see every revival of the church has two characteristics to it. The first, it, we talked about the mountains being brought low. The, the first characteristic of revival is that God moves and there's a great wave of repentance and, and a great wave of healing as the Holy Spirit not only convicts us of our sin, but as we accept that salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he heals that. And he brings us to life in a way that only he can. And the second aspect of a revival is a great surge of the gospel, that people are compelled, compelled by the love of Jesus Christ to bring that gospel to people who need to hear it. And that's our prayer. It's our prayer as we're closing today. So would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you so much for all that you are doing in the world today. Lord, I pray that as your gospel moves out, Father, as we, as we not only read your word, as we not only hear your word, as we speak your word to those around us, that, Father, you would move. Father, I thank you that we, we have this ministry in the same way as we, as we received your mercy, simply because of your grace. And, Father, I thank you for that. I pray now, Lord, that you would speak your grace to our hearts, that, Father, we would be compelled by your love. Father, I just thank you so much for all that you are doing in and through Zarephath Christian Church. I thank you for what you're doing in the world today. And I pray, Father, that you would just continue to call out your people, revive your church, Call us into the work that you are doing in building your kingdom. And Father, to your name be the glory. Amen.